Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer, engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chaberim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. There are many great and memorable opening lines of novels. Call Me Ishmael from Moby Dick. All this happened more or less from Slaughterhouse Five. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife from Pride and Prejudice. One of my favorites comes from Franz Kafka's novella, The Metamorphosis. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. Our guest today has spent decades researching Kafka, why his work is so enduring, and who he was and wasn't. We're delighted to talk with broadcaster, author, and professor Kathy Diamond, who directs the Kafka Project at San Diego State University. Her book, Kafka's Last Love, The Mystery of Dora Diamant, has been translated into several languages. More recently, she authored Heart of the Zoo, How San Diego Zoo Director Chuck Beeler Earned His Stripes. Kathy, welcome to Amusing Jews. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Your book about Franz Kafka and Dora Diamant recovers the story of a woman who was by Kafka's side at the end of his life. Other than sharing a surname with Dora Diamant, what drew you to the subject? What did you learn from researching her life with Kafka? Well, for one, she um, she says that Kafka was an amusing Jew. <laughs> and she's not the only one. Uh, his closest friends said he was an amusing Jew. Uh, Max Brode, who was his literary executor, said that he was the most amusing man he'd ever met. But uh, what, what drew me to the subject? Uh, the coincidence of the last name. I, I was in a German language literature class in college, and the professor interrupted our translation of the metamorphosis to ask if I was related to Dora Diamant. He wrote her name on the blackboard, and it was the same spelling, D-I-A-M-A-N-T. And the only reason I was in class that day was because I had a crush on him. I was not appreciating Kafka. At 19, I, I wasn't getting it at all. I, I kept thinking I had the wrong words because we were translating. It was like, it can't be. He turned, what? Made no sense. But I was there because of this teacher. And he interrupted the translation and said, Fräulein Diamant, are you related to Dora Diamant? And so I said, uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> and I said, who is she? And he said, uh, Dora Diamant was Franz Kafka's last mistress. They were very much in love. He died in her arms, and she burned his work. And so it was that. And my first discovery of her, and what an extraordinary young woman she was, the coincidence not just of the last name, but according to all the biographies at the time, she was 19, I was 19, and the coincidences just kept piling up. So over the course of my adult life, when I, I would get busy with other things, there would be this enormous coincidence that would bring me back to my search for who she was and what became of her. She disappeared from the public record when Kafka died. So it was the coincidences. In fact, that's going to be my third book. Um, it's called, I re reserved the website name, 108 Coincidences, uh, my search on the path to finding Dora and getting Kafka. So that's that's my memoir about where this journey has taken me in my search for Dora. My search for Dora started when I was 19, and it continues today. So it has informed my life, the search and the adventures and the misadventures. And and it started off to as, an, as a query, was I related to her? And it became so much larger after a while, that did not matter. And now that I found Dora's family, we could do a DNA test and find out. But life is a mystery, and not all mysteries get solved. And this is one mystery I like. So I don't know whether I'm related to her, but I do warn people who get involved with the search that I'm conducting through San Diego State University that, that there's a mystical thread to Kafka and, and it's real. Yeah, I think it would go against Kafka if you knew the actual definitive answer to this. 
Exactly. And and boiled down what the real overall arching lesson that I learned from this search was that we are all connected regardless of blood or birth. So that's what I've learned. Yeah. So you mentioned um, that he was amusing. And I know that uh, when he would read, uh, you know, drafts of Metamorphosis to his friends, they would all crack up. And I think people have definitely overanalyzed that book in every which way. But it is one of those stories that most people have heard of, at least. I think most people haven't actually read it. But uh, why do you think that that story in particular is so appealing? Well, for one thing, it's short. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's a novella. Here's, here's, like, here's the metamorphosis and um, short stories. And this much of it, only that part of it, is the metamorphosis. So it's doable. Um, it's also complete. He finished it. Kafka didn't finish most of his writings. All of three novels were published posthumously. All of them are unfinished. Most of his works were unfinished. He wrote in fragments. So this was a piece he crafted. This was a real piece of literature that he created and published during his lifetime. Um, and it's been made accessible in so many other ways. There was a ballet in New York with Mikhail Baryshnikov dancing the part of Gregor Samsel. There are movies. There's numerous movies. There is um, animated short films. There's illustrated books and graphic novels and different play versions of it as well. So it's it's been accessible in different mediums. And another reason is uh, in 2012, I taught a literature class at UCSD, uh, a seminar on Kafka, and I had 12 students. And Two of them chose as their final projects to explore the metamorphosis, one through fashion design and the other uh, inspired by a top level fashion designer who did uh, a fashion show based on the trial. So she did the metamorphosis. But another student uh, compared Gregor and his situation to his brother who had become a drug addict and spent his life in his room as a monstrous vermin to the family who didn't understand. So I, th I think that Kafka is current and he speaks to today um, and has ever since he started writing a hundred years ago. Um, and, and every generation since then seems to discover him anew. And I think Metamorphosis is the most accessible of all of his writings. What is your take in terms of its meaning or deeper layers so this is the thing with Kafka. He has been, and you mentioned this, analyzed to death, deconstructed to death. And you can do that with this book. The number three pops up all the time, and, and there are three borders, and, you know, it's, it's there are numerical aspects to it. There's, But what Dora said is that to really experience Kafka, to get him, is to experience him not through your head or even through your heart, but gustatorily through your body. And to to let the experience um, of, of what you feel in, in reading him be your guide. And nobody can tell you what Kafka meant to say because Kafka never told anybody. He never explained it. So it is important up to each one of us to come up with our own experience of reading that book. And it's not hard to read. I mean, it's really, the sen sentences are simple and it's it's not a hard story to read. What's difficult is the cognitive dissonance that you get from how can this be happening? How can a man wake up uh, transformed into a monstrous vermin and really only be concerned about how is he going to get his tie on so that he can go to work? It is a classic, and I have found in my exploration of this story that it does get deeper, and it has it's more like a maze and a puzzle, and each time you read it, it goes a little deeper. Yeah, actually, the copy of uh, Kafka biography I have behind me, illustrated by Robert Crumb, on on the cover, there's there he is in a maze, right? The whole idea that you're suggesting that the story really kind of doesn't have 
necessarily an endpoint, and you can kind of get lost in the intricacies, right? Exactly. And I love that. I love Robert Crumb and David Zane Marowitz's take on Kafka. It's it's what I recommend to people who haven't been able to crack Kafka yet. If they read this, you get biography, you get some of his stories, you get those stories illustrated as well. It's a wonderful introduction to Kafka. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Kafkaesque is a widely used, maybe overused uh, adjective describing situations that are inscrutable and overly bureaucratic. This is a theme found in Kafka's novels like The Castle and The Trial, but you've cautioned against applying the term to Kafka himself. Why is that? Well, sort of what I said at the beginning, he was an amusing, funny guy and kind and, and full of humor. But his fictional protagonists, Joseph Kay and Kay, and the surreal situations that they find themselves in have sort of become a portrait of Kafka himself. He's become a caricature of his fictional protagonists. And um, the popular image of Kafka being lonely and miserable and alienated and possibly schizophrenic um, doesn't jive with anything anybody who knew him said. It, he was sort of co-opted by the academic or several decades, and that we're only coming out of that now. Um, like I mentioned, Max Brode said he was the most amusing man. Dora said he was cheerful, usually cheerful, always ready for a joke. Um, and and she talks about the times that they spent together in Berlin, the, month that they, the months they spent together in Berlin, um, where he would read to Dora for hours from his favorite stories, and he loved to read, and he had a uh, tremendous acting ability and a lovely baritone voice, and, and his fingers, Dora said, accompanied his words like music. And um, they played games. They pretended that they were already in Tel Aviv, where they were going to open a restaurant, and Dora was going to be the cook and Kafka the waiter. And Dora says that while the dinner got cold, he played the role of the waiter serving them and making all kinds of Charlie Chaplin-esque mistakes. Um, and Dora laughed as the food got cloaked. Um, and uh, in the cold winter nights, in the winter of 1924, uh, as he was dying, and they were so poor that it was the winter of that terrible inflation, um, he used candle stubs to make shadow figures on the wall, and apparently he was very gifted at it. So it, the idea that Kafka himself was Kafka-esque is, is so far from the truth. Max Brode talked about the inevitable distortion of Kafka's image as early as 1943. So he knew that Kafka was going to become distorted, especially because of what was being written about him, um, and he cautioned against it. So that's what I'm saying. Kafka-esque exists as a really valuable word in our society and our culture, uh, but it doesn't apply to the man himself. Kafka's influence on popular culture is all over the place. In Mel Brooks's film, The Producers, Max Bialystok and Leo Bloom search for a play they think will be a flop in order to commit investment fraud. Max reads the first sentence of the metamorphosis out loud and decides it's too good. In the MTV animated series, Daria, there's a poster of Kafka hanging in the room with the main character, Daria Morgendorfer, a cynical teenager who presumably idolizes Kafka, or at least the popular image of Kafka as you were describing. What is your assessment of Kafka's influence on pop culture? Whether you've read Kafka or not, whether you even know his name, he is reflected in our culture and our society. He's he is one of the most influential writers, not only of the 20th century but of the 21st century. Uh, Nobel Prize winners in literature say that Kafka made their writing possible. Um, the he but he's not just a muse to writers. I mean, musicians, composers, artists fine artists, fashion designers, playwrights, mathematicians, actuarians, uh, scientists, neurologists, psychologists, all are influenced by him and inspired by him. And, and 
Kafka is a springboard to, to other realms for a vast variety of people. Um, but he's also um, captured the imaginations of Gen Z. I mean, he was big with the beatniks, cool man. But Gen Z has got him now too. Uh, as of March, I didn't do an update, but as of March of this year, um, on TikTok, hashtag Kafka had over 130 million hits. Uh, fans on Twitter and Instagram say they yearn to be loved like Kafka was and how he loved the women in his life. Uh, one, one young woman, uh, Casey, she tweeted, Kafka is my bare minimum, and I won't date a man unless he is Kafka. And another, uh, oh, one of my favorites was, uh, Kafka is my boyfriend, only he doesn't know it because he's dead. <laughs> so he's, it, it, part of it was, um, there was a re-release of the letters to Milena in which he wrote amazing love letters and letters to Felice, but it was also last year the publication of Kafka's Diaries in the full unexpurgated um, edition by Ross Benjamin. And with that, uh, the memes started popping up. And, and next year is going to be a very big year for Kafka. It's the 100th anniversary of his passing. He died in uh, 20, uh, 1924. So 2024 is the centenary. And in honor of that, there are at least two movies coming out, full funded major stars, big European productions in English. One is called The Glory of Life, and that's a movie that's actually based on a novel that's based on Dora's biography. So that's about Kafka and Dora, and then there's a six-part miniseries coming out next year uh, that will probably be either on Netflix or Prime, um, but that's called France, and it's a six-part mini miniseries based on the biography by Rainer Stach. So Kafka's out there, and he lives. <laughs> Sounds like you're going to be busy on the interview circuit, too. A bit, yeah. Uh, there's also a cottage industry of Kafka kitsch, uh, mugs, T-shirts, pillows, figurines, and the like. What's your take on this part of the phenomenon? <laughs> Here's a fact. Kafka is only second to Shakespeare in the tchotchke department. Shakespeare generates the most PhDs. After that, it's Kafka. And as you mentioned, mugs, T-shirts, pillows, figurines, posters, T-shirts. The interesting thing is this kind of recognition is long time coming. He was banned first under the Nazis and then under the communists. And it wasn't until the fall of and the collapse of the Soviet Union that it became possible to read Kafka in public. When I first went in 1985, there was nothing uh, about Kafka. There was a, there was a bust, uh, a bronze bust of him at the top of a building, a triangular-shaped building. But they had a burlap sack, sack over it, so you couldn't see his face. And uh, you could visit his grave, but there was no publication. There was nothing that said where it was or how to find it. So in 1985, Kafka was not visible in Prague. Um, but since then, uh, he has, his image has become an icon, um, a symbol of Prague, and his name is everywhere. And he has his own museum, um, the Kafka Museum. There are cafes, restaurants, there's a bookstore. Well, bookstore is closed right now. Hopefully that'll change. Um, but it, in Prague a few years ago, even I had enough. They had taken the KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken logo, and instead of Cardinal Sanders, they had Franz Kafka with little bow tie. That was, again, uh, that was too much. I, I thought, okay, that's enough. But it's interesting. Everybody claims Kafka. Um, German, it, it, he wrote in German, uh, so and his writings are integral to the study of German literature, so the Germans claim him. The Austrians claim him because he was born in the Austrian Empire before Czech Republic even existed. Um, and um, so the Czechs now claim him because he was born there and is buried there and lived most of his life there. But significantly, significantly, he's also claimed by Israel. 
And uh, when uh, his last papers were uncovered, there was a huge trial to see who owned Kafka. And it turns out Israel does. So um, Israel has um, the Broad Collection now in the National Library, and they've just built a brand new library in Jerusalem off of the campus where it was, uh, Hebrew University campus, and it's now in the center of Jerusalem, and it just recently opened this gorgeous new National Library, in part because of these Kafka papers. As you mentioned in uh, post-communist Prague, they've really embraced Kafka, in addition to the Golem, uh, both of these characters, as it were, of course, Kafka being a real person and the golem being a homegrown monster of uh, Prague lore, they're now major tourist attractions, which is remarkable for a number of reasons. I think the most remarkable is that they're both Jewish. Uh, how did that all come about? And is there a recognition of his Jewishness, perhaps, in Prague, or is he just more universal in KFC, like you were alluding to yeah, I think the way most Czechs look at it uh, that I've spoken to is that they're marketing ploys. And um, a lot of the Czech people I speak to are are largely over Kafka, uh, but not fortunately entirely, uh, because my book is finally coming out in a Czech edition. Uh, so um, so there there is still a window of hope. <laughs> but um, a lot of Czechs in general, seem to have a more, I don't know, cynical, darker view of life than, say, me. And um, they feel like Kafka has been shoved down their throats a bit. So, uh, and he, it, and it is a little too, and the Gollum, when I was just there in February, there was the Gollum restaurant, there were Gollum statues. So I don't remember the Gollum being such a big presence before. So it's sort of like the Berlin teddy bear. Uh, Stoifel there. It's 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 become a symbol that they can market and they can put on keychains. Um, hopefully, uh, with Dora's book being published in the Czech Republic in the next couple of years, uh, there's a new window into Czechs appreciating Kafka through Dora's eyes. And so I maintain that hope. Scholars have debated Kafka's Jewish identity. Like most aspects of his life and work, this subject has been analyzed to death. What's the short answer to the question, how Jewish was Kafka? The short answer? Very, very, <laughs> very, okay. So here it is. You know, I don't, it, he was the grandson of a Moravian rabbi on his mother's side. Uh, he wrestled and wrote about faith for his entire life. His Hebrew name was Amshul. Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, a German Jewish philosopher and literary critic, said he said this kafka is quintessentially the ultimate jewish writer um gershom sholem foremost academic authority on jewish mysticism in our modern times once said to understand kabbalah in our time or kabbalah in our time first we will have to read franz kafka and my authority on this subject comes entirely from dora diamond or diamond uh, from her perspective as the only woman with whom kafka ever lived uh, and the research that I did on her to write her biography, Dora wrote about her experience with Kafka's relationship with Judaism through her own as the daughter of a deeply pious follower of the Wonder Rebbe of Gare, and also as a woman who examined her religion and her place in it for her entire life. So what she has to say about Kafka's growing awareness and and observance of the Jewish rituals carries a lot of weight. Uh, Dora said that Kafka bore, she said he bore all of the burden and anti-Semitism of being a Jew, but without any of the spiritual sustenance that the religion offers. And Kafka also, will give him the last word on the subject. Uh, he said in a letter to Max Brod, he said, we both know after all enough typical examples of Western Jews. I am, as far as I know, the most typical Western Jew among them. So, very. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Kathy. 
Well, my deep pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to not just talk about Kafka, but about Dora as well. Thank you. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe.